And there was nothing else at all in the whole world but football. Hi everyone, hope you're all well. Simon here from the Triple F. Welcome back to another episode of the Triple F Cinema, where I'm joined by Man United fan, poet, comedian and teacher Tony Kinsella to review the 2009 film Looking for Eric. As Tony is actually friends with many of the actors in the film, he gives us a lot of behind the scenes insight. So without further ado, here's the chat I had with Tony about Looking for Eric. Two tickets to that football film, right now. I think this is going to be less of a, a sort of critical film review and more of a, a one where you can sort of just fill us in with the stories because I know you're uh, quite connected to a few of the people involved in the film well, and the I just the thing is that it was more or less filmed on my doorstep you know I've, I don't know if you've ever watched a film and done location spotting but I could pretty much uh, you know those things literally at the end of the street where I was living and Salford University and whatever and then yeah um, all those postmen um, I think every single one of them apart from the two main actors who are, who are actors were basically stand-up comedians and still are uh, one of them's passed away now, but the rest of them are still going strong on, on the Manchester circuit. And in fact, two in particular, Smug Roberts and Justin Morehouse, are, are totally involved in the whole FC United thing and do all the, you know, the pre-match entertainments and the, the the radio cast and all that type of thing. So yeah, it was uh, yeah, it was weird watching a film where you kind of knew everybody and, and knew every single street <laughs> corner, and then you know, for it to be with, about Cantona, who was such a hero of the the United faithful. Anyway, yeah, it was uh, yeah, I think there are. One or two shortcomings in it, but we can obviously talk about that. But um, yeah, my experience is pretty positive on the whole. Definitely better than Holy Holy by the sound of it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just sort of tell us some of the stories that you've been told from the friends that, you you know, you, that, that have been involved in the film, that would be fantastic. Yeah, um, so Ken Loach is very keen to work with stand-up comedians. Um, his big hit a couple of years ago was uh, I, Daniel Blake, and Dave, Davy Johns, who won all kinds of awards for that one, is a, is a Geordie comedian who never really acted in his life. <laughs> uh, so Ken Loach seems to really kind of be keen on working with comedians alongside actors. And the cast of um, Looking for Eric, it absolutely amazes me watching it on the big screen because they're all stand-up comedians who I've worked with constantly uh, on, on the Manchester comedy scene at places like the Frog and Bucket and the Comedy Store. Um, I've only ever been um, a hobby comedian. I, I, I work in education. Um, but it's the amazing thing about doing stand-up comedy. You, you get to work with people who go on to become legends. I've worked with Sarah Millican and John Bishop and uh, Johnny Vegas and people like that, and they all started somewhere. So, you know, I was I started doing stand-up in 1999 in Manchester, so pretty much the entire cast of that film, Justin Morehouse, Smug Roberts, Mick Ferry, uh, Steve Marsh, who plays the gangster character, a guy called Des Sharples, Greg, Greg Cook, who sadly passed away um, a few years ago, and... It was weird watching them on the screen because they're all people uh, that I perform stand-up with. So when you watch the film, a lot of it is kind of, I would say, semi-improvised because um, I've actually got, I'm old school, I've got the DVD and there's a few interesting documentaries and Q&As on it. So I picked up quite a lot from that. And um, the scene where they're all talking about Winnie Mandela and, um, you know, who, who they admire and things like that. Yeah, yeah. The scene which I don't think particularly works where they all go and tell him a joke to cheer him up. That's basically what would be happening in the green rooms in the Frog and Bucket and the Comedy Store Manchester. So, you know, there was a sort of script. He works with um, a script writer, I think, called uh, Laverty, I think his name is. So Ken Loach always works with the same screenwriter. But it appears that the reason he chose a lot of Mancunian comedians who knew each other's inside leg measurements and <laughs> knew each other inside out is because you got that very kind of plausible naturalistic banter between them which which works incredibly well in the film you do you do get that sense of community and comradeship and, and being there for each other and without it being too saccharine or too sweet you know at the end of the day there's it's a very sweary film <laughs> a very kind of laddish film but with, with a kind of real heart and soul of you know helping out your neighbor and, and supporting each other in in a way that the football community does the comedy community does and in that case post post office workers 
do you think the decision to have the language um so poetic shall we say um was was made because that sort of envisions and that sort of um and typifies football and that culture of football in the best way um working class males uh, were yeah. working in, in in this case a post office but you could do the same thing for a group of bin men possibly even office workers to an extent but more, more the kind of um uh, the, the sort of lower lower working class males and the language of that post office community is is the language of the stand up comedy. I was surprised when I went back to it for the first time in a few years that they dropped the C bomb within about thirty seconds. Um, even within the comedy circuit, that's not necessarily a word that you'll commonly hear. It's a it's a provocative word, and uh, you know pe- people do do kind of shy away from it unless the context of it is appropriate, kind of thing. So I was quite surprised at how sweary it was, but I guess I shouldn't have been because you know Ken Loach knows that knows that community, Ken, Ken Loach knows that, that social class. And that is, like you say, <laughs> that is the kind of poetry and the subtext of, of people, a largely male working class environment where there are no, there is no censorship and, and, and people are not afraid to, to, to drop the C-bomb or whatever other word they want to use. So it was authentic, wasn't it? It was, it was extremely sweary. And I was a little bit taken aback <laughs> at how it started to, to kind of hit me with the, with the, the, the strength of those swear words early on, but um, I didn't have a problem with it. I, I just hadn't quite remembered it that way. <laughs> I, I think for me, maybe it's because I've spent so much time over here in Holland, and I, I swear like a, a a sailor at the best of times. I it, re- it really wasn't something that stood out so much, um, and it felt quite natural. Maybe it was because of that, you know, um, it feeling realistic towards the sort of postman setting, like you say, and. You know, yeah, I, I just, I, it didn't feel such a, a jarring element of the film and it felt quite sort of realistic in a sense. So, yeah, I, I didn't mind it so much. And um, Also, apart from being a football community, it was very much a sort of gangland community, wasn't it, in, in terms mm. of what his, his, his son had got involved in. So, you know, that, that would absolutely have been the language of that community and, and, and the sort of aggression between uh, the characters who were forcing each other to do things and not wanting to do things and opposing each other and, and fighting back. So it was, yeah, it, if it hadn't had that level of language, it, it would have felt a little bit uh, anodyne. So so I, th- I think it was right. Ken Loach was absolutely right. Not that he needs any lessons from me, but <laughs> Ken Loach was absolutely right to have that that uh, that volume of swearing, really. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, the casting of the film, I was, I was really impressed with the casting. I thought it was fantastic. And it is a bit of a, a, a trivial question, but Steve Evetts, like, how do you pronounce Evetts? Is that Steve Evetts? I think I think it's Evetts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that is must be a made-up name because it's a palindrome, isn't it, Steve Evetts? Yeah, good, but yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I say I don't know much about him because he was very much um, a, a fringe jobbing actor. Really, I don't mean that in any way um, offensively because he's he's absolutely brilliant in the film, but he'd had little bit parts in TV series like Shameless and things like that. But uh, I've seen him crop up in you know small roles in lots of films, but. I've never seen him in a starring role in a film and sort of carried it. It's very much an ensemble piece, but I, I think he is absolutely terrific at the heart of it. And, mm-hmm. you know, Ken Loke spotted something there that <laughs> other directors hadn't seen because he, he, was, he was certainly, he, he's, he's not a young actor in that film, but it was his first really major break, I think. Mm. But no, he he was absolutely brilliant. I, yeah, I echo your thoughts on that one. I thought he was fantastic. But, um, yeah, I was really, really impressed by him. Uh, especially like you say as well, if he if that's more or less his first sort of main um uh central role, that was yeah, it was wonderful. But um I don't I mean to be honest, I don't know a massive amount about Ken Loach. I should do because I, I studied film in in um at London Met, so I, I I should know quite a bit, especially when it comes to the theoretical side of things as well, is that the course that I, I did at university was mostly sort of theory based. So I should know a, a fair deal about Ken Loach, but unfortunately I don't, I think most of the, the focus was on um, uh, the other guy, uh, Lee. What's the, I've forgotten his first name. Mike Lee, Mike Lee. Oh, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. 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 A lot, of it, a lot of the focus was on Mike Lee films instead, but with Ken Loach is, um, his sort of approach to directing and, and filmmaking, is it more a improvisational kind of approach? Does he allow uh, a lot of improvise, uh, like allow the sort of um, the, the actors in the cast to improvise as they sort of go along? Because it sort of felt like that to a sense. My understanding from what I've seen on the 
on the documentary on the DVD and, and speaking to some, some of the lads who were in it, uh, there is a script, but they get it very, very late in the day. So there isn't this kind of um, robotic uh, learning of lines and, and going through the scenes 10, 20, 25 times. They, they, they get the, and it's a kind of fairly loose script anyway, and they're allowed to improvise around it. I mean, again, the scene where uh, my friend Des Sharples is, is being Nelson Mandela, talking about Winnie Mandela and <laughs> kind of going off on one. I don't think you can script that. I don't, I don't think you can write that. I think I think it very much is, you know, yeah. obviously there is a lot of spontaneity in comedy. Even comedians who go on stage with um, a very clear script of what they're going to talk about, something will happen in the room or, you know, there'll be a reaction or a sudden thought will come into their head. So I think he's giving extremely talented comedians uh, a certain amount of mileage to do that. But within that, you don't want it to be too loose. And, and he is actually, um, you know, he is approaching them with a script that, is at the heart of what they're doing. It's just that they they can improvise around it. I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As far as I'm aware, that's a pretty similar sort of approach to what Mike Lee sort of takes on as well. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah he, he he has the the sort of spine of a script there, and then sort of allows the the actors to sort of um, play with it a bit more on the fringes. So yeah. And it, yeah. But and that definitely shines through in the film as well. You can sort of really get that organic feeling across from the film. Uh, Lodge has been doing it since the very start because what still one of his most lauded films is it was either his first or his second the film called Kes, uh, which is based on mm. a Barry Heights novel about a little boy in the most horrible circumstances with him, you know, parents who are neglecting him or a single mum who's neglecting him, a brother who beats him up. And again, it's just again you've got an actor who never acted before um at the centre of it and uh, the the young boy who who plays Billy Casper. And it's just naturalistic, you know, it doesn't it never feels as if people are acting. Look at the classroom scenes in that film. Look at the famous football scene with um, the PE teacher being Bobby Charlton. And it's just so incredibly authentic and believable. You know, it, do- it doesn't feel like actors acting. It feels it feels like a documentary. And I think, yeah, you mentioned uh, Mike Lee. And I think they're both two absolutely brilliant um, directors who, with their best work, not necessarily with the whole of their work, but with their best work, can make you feel as if you're just eavesdropping into somebody's life. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think for for Mike Lee, is it Secrets and Lies? I think it was is yeah. perhaps one of the best standout um, examples of what you just mentioned there. So no, it was it's great. Um, so yeah, let's let's try and talk about the big man himself as as much as possible. Really, um, a bit of a weird one to start with. But do you know much about him uh, being a trumpet player? Was that sort of natural? Was it was he is he an actually is he actually playing the trumpet in that scene? There? The, the, the tr- I believe he did actually have a little bit of a, a trumpet skill and that he does play it himself. I think it was all meant to be a bit of a metaphor about blowing your own trumpet, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> in terms of, you know, what, why the trumpet sort of thing. Yeah, so no, that, that, that was the thing that surprised me when I first watched it. It's actually on the DVD cover, so they're obviously very proud of the fact that they got Cantona playing the trumpet. <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've, that's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's strange, actually, that now you say it, that actually makes a lot of sense. But, um, yeah, for when I sort of first... I even watched it the, the second time. I sort of felt, why, why on earth they have that in there? But you think saxophone, wouldn't you? You think Cantona would be a saxophone? Player, <laughs> yeah, you? yeah, so much cooler. Yeah, yeah. But it, mind you, like, yeah, it's it was a weird sort of instrument to pull out. But bit Cantona being as cool as Cantona is, it still made that seem extremely cool. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it was yeah. cool. Um, do you, I mean, do you have any idea if if the film sort of came before they they chose Cantona or, or it was did... the other way around Cantona chose Ken Loach from all accounts um Cantona actually had I mean as you probably know when he when he quit football he was in the film Elizabeth he did some fabulous adverts pretending to be a farmer he, he's done all, all and he's done French films as well uh my understanding is I mean Cantona is very much um left of center politically his father fought in the Spanish Civil War um so you know and he's he's got behind various causes um very strongly so my understanding was that he was familiar with Ken Loach's work and actually approached Ken Loach directly and said, can you build a film around me with, with me actually playing myself in it? So, yeah, it was um, it was very much a Cantonale-led project, as I understand it. If you're interested in coming on the show for an Under the Floodlight special to talk about your favourite player or manager, please email the thefff2021 at gmail.com or DM the thefff84 on Twitter. All contact details will be in the episode description. Hope you're all keeping safe and thanks again for listening to the Triple F. 
Are you able to sort of reflect on on Cantona a bit more as a as a United fan? Because I think you said you you wanted to to sort of mention a bit more about that. There's a, I mean, you know the story about how they bought him, don't you? That he was he just won the title with Leeds and, and pushed United into second place, and he was quite instrumental in that. He wasn't necessarily in the starting eleven every week, but he was he was a real kind of contributor to the fact that you know Leeds managed to um, to win that trophy, the first Premier League, was it the last league title or the first Premier League? But certainly that period. But anyway, um, my understanding is there's a number of different stories about why they got him so cheap, isn't there? Some people say he was having an affair with Howard Wilkinson's wife. Some people have said it was Leslie Ash who was the partner of um, Lee Dick, uh, not Lee Dixon, Lee Chapman at the time. Um, but there's a, a wonderful story in uh, in the Cantona biography that Brian Kidd, who was uh, Ferguson's number two, was coaching the players. And Ferguson actually rang up Leeds United chairman. I think he was trying to buy Gary Kelly, the fullback, and that was the only reason he made the call. And by the end of a 15-minute call, he bought Cantona for 1.1 million. Um, and the story is he rang Brian Kidd on the training ground and uh, he said, I've just bought Eric Cantona. You'll never guess how much. 1.1 million. And apparently Brian Kidd's spontaneous reaction was, fucking hell, which leg has he had amputated? So, you know, <laughs> and, and, and when you look at, um, I mean, Cantona wasn't there very long. And yet, you know, when, when you do these polls about the greatest United player of all time, you tend to get a sort of combination of Keane Scholes, Giggs, or, or possibly George Best, if we go back far enough. But Cantona invariably comes in the top, uh, you know, one or two. And yet he was only there for a relatively short amount of time. But I mean, the story is that he transformed the club in lots of ways that were not necessarily visible and transparent, that the way he transformed people's diet and attitude and and winning mentality and things like that, that, you know, Ferguson famously kicked a boot into David Beckham's face when Beckham was one of the great global superstars. And yet apparently Cantona was completely untouchable by by Ferguson, one of the few people that he never really took on. The very famous incident at uh, Crystal Palace where he attacked the fan. Apparently, when they went into the dressing room, all the players were saying, oh my God, Eric's for it now. And he turned around and had an absolute go at Gary Pallister for giving the ball away on the Crystal Palace goal. <laughs> yeah. Laid into it with the famous, um, you know, the famous treatment. Um, uh, yeah, the hairdryer Robin, treatment. Uh, the hairdryer treatment. And then after about five minutes, he turned around to Cantona and said, Eric, don't do that again, son. And, you know, and everybody's what? <laughs> when, you, you, when you consider it was on the front page of every newspaper and it was kind of the story. So so there's that element of him. And, and yet, you know, as, as I said, I know a lot of the locations that were in um, looking for Eric and the posh bit of Salford. Yes, we do have one, uh, a place called Worsley, which is where Cantona um, lived and, and his son went to the private school there. Apparently, he'd turn up in the pub quite regularly and play pool with the regulars and have a chat with them and do the pub quizzes and things like that. And whenever anybody wanted a selfie with him, if we called them selfies in those days, um, he'd always be you know, more than happy to, to oblige kind of thing and was kind of um, a very well-known and well-respected member of the community. So this this kind of aloofness, which actually he really plays on in the film, and I, I can't believe that he agreed to deliver some of the lines that he does. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that, that's part of his... He, he was self-deprecated as an Arsenal fan. You know, other fans obviously absolutely hated him and, and saw him as, you know, being right stuck up himself. But apparently it was all a little bit of a, a pose, really. And the fact that is the famous thing about the sealers and the trawler, isn't they? But some of the lines in the film are equally ludicrous that, that have been written for him. But he clearly wanted the project. He was clearly happy to deliver these lines that in many ways make him come across as quite ridiculous. But he, he was happy to be ridiculed. He was he was happy to play that role. What's your favourite favourite ones then, mate? I want to hear them. <laughs> oh, the actual lines. Oh, I, I uh, for for me, the one that, one that sticks out really well is "I'm not a man, I'm Cantona." Yeah, there's that one. Then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's something about if you tease the lion, it will fight back or something. And they're all, you know, like the sealers and trawler one. They're all really yeah. meaningless, aren't they? <laughs> sort of things that you see on posters with pictures of the ocean and whatever. Yeah, but but clearly, you know, they must have had great fun writing it. I bet, I bet they all, you know, all those stand-up comedians were probably chipping a few in. So you know, but uh, yeah, just. God bless him for being prepared to send himself up in that way because, you know, it's, it's 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 the best way to do it, isn't it, rather than everybody, everybody taking the mickey out of you, take the mickey out of yourself instead. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, that's, I don't know, the, yeah, it wasn't... The thing is, that, like, as an Arsenal fan, you're right. I, I think I remember at the time really disliking Cantona. Uh, I think even, yeah, if I was a, a Leeds United fan, a Liverpool fan, anything, just... Uh, a non-Man United fan, I think you would have just despised Cantona at the time. But looking back at it now, and also with what's going on with the Super League and and seeing how football is, is 
traversed into the the sort of style and the type of football that we have today. The characters such as Cantona that we had back in the day, I think all football fans miss having characters like that. And he was, yeah, just a, a phenomenal um, personality to, to have in, in the game. And um, yeah, he's someone that I would love to have had in the Arsenal squad. But, um, you were talking yeah. earlier as well about the, the spontaneity of Ken Loach's filmmaking. And, and one of the things that comes out on the, um, on the documentary on the DVD, uh, the, the scene where Steve Everts turned around, and Steve Everts was the biggest United fan and, and still is. And mm. Like a lot of United fans of that era, you know, treated Cantona almost as kind of godlike status. But there's a scene in the film where he turns around and sees Cantona for the first time, where his character sees him for the first time. And apparently uh, there was a Belgian guy on the film crew and Ken Loach said he was going to do the scene with this Belgian guy because Cantona wasn't available. So he said, he'll say something to you in a French accent and then you turn around and pretend it's Cantona. What Steve Everts didn't know is that Cantona was actually in the room. <laughs> and when you see Steve Everts turn around and say, fucking hell, Eric. Apparently, that's, that's not the character saying that. That's Steve Everett. <laughs> Absolutely can't be. He did the same thing, apparently, with the scene where uh, the police come charging in while they're all having the dinner, um, you know, with, with the various yeah. family members and his daughter. And apparently, nobody knew when they sat down to do They thought they were just doing a scene around the dinner table and nobody knew that all these... Uh, people in police uniforms are going to come back pouring in. So again, when you see the uh, the shock yeah. and disbelief, uh, that, that apparently was was the actors who were reacting in that way. But yeah, yeah, no, apparently, you, yeah. You definitely you definitely get that impression when um, when you're watching the film. I did anyway. Yeah. I, I had it on with the had my headphones in, <laughs> and it absolutely, you know, it yeah, it woke me up. It was ter- it was terrifying that, and then, yeah. Um, I think because that scene is so quiet, and then all of a sudden that just happens, and especially yeah. if you if you sort of see it from Lily's point of view, the way that she acts in that as well, and if you say that it it appears to be extremely natural, and it yeah, and and that was the sort of intention that Ken Loach had, um, that comes across really well as well, um, but yeah, it was it was that 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 scene as well, just sort of imagine it from her point of view how terrifying that just must be especially her being absolutely none the wiser that would have been yeah horrible it's interesting as well that you mentioned the super league simon because um we're doing this podcast two days after man united fans have got a game against liverpool cancelled on a sunday afternoon Mm. and it's about protesting against the glazers and again that theme is very much in the film isn't it and Mm. it's interesting that Cantona engaged with that idea of you know the kind of anti-glazer sentiment and of course he would have been playing at the time when they had the golden and green i remember him scoring a very famous goal against wimbledon wearing the golden green which was very much the kind of um you know the throwback to the old days uh so you know in, in the film uh justin morehouse and um smug roberts in particular who are two of the comedians yeah. they're massively involved in fc united and there's a scene where justin morehouse is telling them to stop supporting United, then they pretend that they scored a goal and he comes running back in and, you know, that kind of, uh, that mixed loyalty that you get. So, yeah, yeah. it very much addresses that in the film, doesn't it, about whether, yeah. whether people should be supporting Man United, PLC or FCUM. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what I like in, in that as well, especially because you see the amount of, well, the whole scene is dressed up as, as you know, the, the sort of hardcore United fans scoffing at the idea of um, FC United. But surely yeah. that, that, that sort of ratio has probably gone the other way now because I, I imagine there's probably a lot more people interested in in that idea of FC United these days than, yeah. than there were yeah. back then. And then, um, you, you know, there was sort of well ahead of its time back then as well to sort of even mention that in the film. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was great to see because I think the first time I watched it, like I say, about 10, 12 years ago, um, I thought, what are these idiots talking about? What, <laughs> what are they going on about? And... But now it makes the absolute most sense, really. I think I'm right in saying that Ken Loach's team is Bath City and that he was quite invested in them. I wouldn't even be able to tell you what league Bath City play in, but clearly he would he would identify with a grassroots club, uh, you know, trying to survive and, and build something. Yeah, yeah. But um no, that yeah, it was it was it was great to see that. And I think especially now uh viewing it in a lens of the the Super League as well, it's um yeah, it couldn't be more prevalent, really. Like finding out as much as you can about clubs you've heard of and those you haven't? Then come check out The Magic Of, where we delve as deep as possible into the rich history of weird and wacky clubs all over the world. I think you talked about the focus on mental health, which I thought was absolutely right. 
um, you know, I teach English. Uh, I'm, I'm teaching uh, students to write stories in 45 minutes for an exam. And they all want to put three or four boring paragraphs in before anything happens. The natural instinct is to say, I woke up one morning and then I had my breakfast and then this happened. And then eventually on the fourth paragraph, something actually happens. There's no <laughs> hanging about in this film, is there? The very first scene oh. is him going round and round the roundabout and, and, and almost kind of dying at the end of it. And then within 30 seconds of that, we've got this absolutely falling apart home life with the two boys not bothering to go to school and one of them being involved in, in, in sort of some dubious activities and that type of thing. So it's a film that doesn't really hang about. And yeah, you get a man having a mental health breakdown in the first 20, 30 seconds of the film. So again, you know, very, very again, just switching to um, I, Daniel Blake and the spontaneity again, that there's a scene in the I, Daniel Blake film where the female character, Hayley, is in a food bank and then suddenly totally out the blue, she rips open a can of beans and starts shoving them into her mouth. And I've seen that film twice and that scene made me cry both times, even the second time when I knew that it was coming. And it was just so real. You know, and, and that's that's the thing, you know, it's it's not... You watch soap operas where they're beating you over the head with emotions and putting music on at the right place and all that type of thing. And Ken Loach does seem to be able to grab you by the throat and really throw raw emotions at you. And, you know, that as I say, the, the, the Daniel Blake film, that, that there was a Toby Young, the right-wing journalist, complained that Ken Loach filmed a food bank in Newcastle. And he said, it's pathetic. He recruited a load of actors and there's nowhere near as many people as that queuing at food banks. It was really exaggerated over the top. To which Ken Loach said, we didn't use any actors. We just turned up at a food bank. That's how many people were queuing there. The people in, in, inside the, um, the home are actual uh, workers at a food bank. None of them were extras or actors. You know? <laughs> so yeah. shove that in your pipe, uh, Toby Young. So, yeah, he's, um, he's a filmmaker that really wants to make a difference and, and really wants to address important issues in, in the right way. Mm. No, yeah, I, th I think it is really important. And a film that it kind of reminds me of, of a little bit as well is um, Frank. Uh, with um, I'm trying to think the Irish guy Michael Fassbender so it's a film um, about a band and um, the main character in it uh, yeah, is bottom, he, was, he was an absolute yes. legend but yeah in the Manchester yeah. area yeah, yeah so he he wears a Frank Sidebottom um, yeah. head there's a, there's a statue of him in Timperley which is where he's um, where he's from yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah this this fella um, he's just like a lead singer and he for some reason it, it uses that as a sort of mask but it, it sort of plays on the idea of um, artistic creativity uh, very much bordering on a very thin line between that and and mental health and um yeah, it's re it's really good and it's really fantastic. And I think you know the the sort of comparisons that I make to looking for Eric is that th there is very much a thin line between that and sort of um, sort of, and sort of just bottling things in and keeping them in and and you know saying or just sort of saving face for for the sake of it and not feeling inclined to sort of talk about it with your mates and whatnot. And I think that's that's something that felt really good in the film. It felt um, nice to see that, that, you know, that, that you had the friends there that were supporting his mate and, and they were, you know, doing these crazy meditation things to try and do what they could to, to help their mate out. And especially now, if you um, look back at it 10 years uh, on from that film or however long ago it was, um, the, the sort of uh, encouragement to talk about mental health issues now is fantastic. We've come a hell of a long way, and that's yeah. something that I'm I'm proud of, uh, and then I'm happy to see that that you know it's it's not a taboo anymore. It's not a a, a scary thing to to talk about your issues and and mental health issues, especially in football. I think in football, that sort of bravado. 10 20 years ago, if you even thought about talking about your mental health issues, you'd get a black eye. It's um. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see how far it's come. I think Jesse Lingard quite recently, who, you know, had his problems at United and couldn't get in the team, has just had a new lease of life on loan at West Ham. I don't know what's going to happen there, but he, he was really open about just how much depression he was suffering. You know, the instincts say, why, why are you suffering from depression? You're on tens of thousands a week. There's people unemployed. You're in one of the biggest clubs. In, and it, it, you know, Robbie Williams committed suicide, didn't he? Um, one of the funniest men in the world, one of the you know one of yeah. the richest actors, and apparently had a wonderful family life. He had a, a really loving younger wife and, and, and a family, and, and suddenly he decided he couldn't take it anymore. So yeah, I think it, it's not the taboo that it was, and and people are a little bit more informed about it. It's not just a case of you know <laughs> pulling your collar up and getting on with it kind of thing. That you know that people are much more aware of it, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. If um if I had to push you, and I I'm, I'm I'm sorry, like because I know 
uh, you've got a lot of friends who are involved in the film uh, so this might be difficult for you but if you could give me a sort of review uh, and give me a rating out of 10 uh, sure. what, what what would you sort of say for the film yeah I mean the Pretty much everything about the film I really like. Um, as I said, it, it's very laddish and very sweary, and maybe there should have been the female characters maybe a little bit more thinly sketched. You know, I'm not quite sure that the relationship with Lily it's quite touching in places, but and, and maybe the relationship with the daughter is a little bit cliched. I'm, I'm picking out negatives here, but you know, most most of my feeling I think it's genuinely laugh out loud funny. I think there's really great sequences in it. You know, the the, the smashing up the um, incidentally, uh, the, the guy who's Steve Marsh, who's uh, the one whose house they go around to. Ryan Giggs must be living more or less next door to that house because that's where oh, Ryan really? Giggs lives. I know exactly which road it is, and yeah, Giggsy lives <laughs> on that on that road. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So yeah, the the, the Cantona masks and the um, the very improvised scenes and the, the, as you say, the the full on uh, drama and all that type of thing. I'd be giving it a good eight and a half, possibly even nine out of ten. I, I think it's a, a really wonderful film. I was thinking about films that roughly follow the same premise: the idea of somebody legendary guiding you at your your darkest moments and. There's probably not many around. There was um, uh, Play It Again, Sam, the Woody Allen film, where mm. Humphrey Bogart comes out the screen and starts guiding him in terms of you know how to have a relationship with women and Woody Allen's playing the paranoid and, and, and Humphrey Bogart is obviously super cool. There's also a film called Jojo Rabbit, which is relatively recent, where Adolf Hitler is, uh, is of all people, he's kind of mentoring the character and he, he can't quite decide whether or not he believes in Hitler's principles. Also, when I was a kid, oh, sorry, when my children were very young, uh, there was a program they used to watch that involved Michael Owen coming out of a poster, and it was a, in a funny sort of way, not a million miles removed from what the Cantona film's all about. He was um, guiding a teenager. Michael Owen was the most dreadful and wooden actor you could possibly imagine uh, in your entire life, but you know Cantona does it much more naturally. But I like that concept of somebody that you look up to and admire um, being your guide and being the person that uh, you turn to. There's that lovely scene in the film, isn't there, when? He asked him what was his favourite moment on the, in a United shirt and he's expecting him to pick out the goal mm. against Sunderland or the cup final winner against Liverpool. And he picks a pass to Dennis Irwin and as soon as he says it, Steve Everett says, yes, it was that pass. And it's about, you know, not necessarily being the main man, but knowing how to work with your team. And, and, and that's exactly yeah. what, you know, somebody having, a, as we said, an absolutely raw, full on nervous breakdown in the first 30 seconds of the film. How does he save himself? He engages with his own children. He engages with his ex-girlfriend. He engages with um, his, his colleagues and he engages with Eric Cantona. And it, it is very much about that thing. You know, in, in a year when we've just been all locked down for a year <laughs> because of a <laughs> pandemic, I think that idea of um, the importance of community, which is absolutely crucial to Ken Loach's work, um, is, is absolutely integral to it. So very long-winded answer to your question. But yeah, I'd say probably about an eight and a half out of ten for me. That's you? For, yeah, you know, I, I pretty much agree with that. I'd say... Um... I'd go. I'd go nine. I, I, yeah, I'd happy happily say nine. I, I thought it was a, a brilliant, just heartwarming film, and, and and one that just, yeah, like I think like you mentioned the the sort of swearing. I personally don't mind the swearing. I, I, I I'm quite partial to a a nice little swear word <laughs> here and there, so I'm quite happy with that. But um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it just as much as I did the first time around. I think I understood it a lot more the second time round. Um, I think I watched them when I was quite well. I was sort of in my teens, so I wasn't. And and having had the sort of um, film studies education that I had as well, I sort of noticed a lot more, uh, especially the sort of improvisational techniques that that came through a lot more the second time that I watched it. Um, but yeah, it just just a, a a brilliant British independent film, and and one that you can't um, can't help but enjoy really. Did it make you reappraise your opinions of Cantona himself? Or um, yeah, like I said, I mean, he was somebody that I, I kind of disliked as a kid, but sort of looking back at it, you can't help but admire the guy. Um, it was just the epitome of cool. And um, yeah, he was just a, a brilliant player. And that pass, like you mentioned as well, what a phenomenal pass that was. Like, the, Yeah. And that was something I really enjoyed in the film is is the sort of um, the playbacks and the clips of the the the, the footage, the actual um, match footage as well was just fantastic because I think a lot of the issues in football films is when they try and recreate football in film and I, and I hate to bring it up again you already mentioned it but holy goalie <laughs> when they actually try and um, you know uh, feature football in that film it, it's, it's terrible but I think the same with like the damned United in a sense that you see 
as little football as possible. In a sense, that's better for me. I think yeah. what's more important in the film are these relationships and these performances and the stories. They're the they're the thing that really matters. Uh, but when the worst one ever was it? Uh, it was Ian McShane who plays Lovejoy was in a film called Yesterday's Hero. You really should do that one for, for all the wrong <laughs> reasons. But there's um, on the football scenes. It's actually a cup final between Nottingham Forest and Southampton. You can actually see people like Gary Birtles from that era. And all they've basically done is intercut it with some of the actors going, give me the ball. There's never been a footballer in the history of the world who shouted, give me the ball. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. but you can tell that it's a different film. They're wearing Nottingham Forest and Southampton shirts. But the, <laughs> the style of the film completely changes and you can tell yeah. they're doing it in a studio or whatever. It's, it's, it's so good. It, I mean, it's so bad that you have to see it, but, you know, it's absolutely, it's absolutely terrible. I was just thinking I've done this entire interview without putting my collar up, so... Oh, what you doing? <laughs> what you doing? There you go. There you go. That's very apt. Very apt for a, to, to, to sort of send the send the uh, this this podcast episode off on. So, but, yeah, it's fantastic. But, yeah, thank you very much again, Tony, That's for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. And I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's one that I, I uh, sort of recommend people to watch looking for eric if they haven't already seen it it's a Absolutely, it's a I brilliant agree. one to see yeah i'm so glad to go back to it for the first time in so many years though i'm, I'm glad that you kind of encouraged me to do that yeah. yeah yeah excellent all right tony thanks again buddy take care simon yeah all the best to you mate thank you so much for listening to the triple f if you could please drop a like on our facebook page subscribe to the youtube channel and follow us on Twitter, that would be massively appreciated. Hope you're all keeping safe, and thanks again for listening to The Triple F.